That is a band called Latin Empire from New York, composed of Puerto Ricans, and the song is Proud to be Puerto Rican. Uh, so it's an example of uh, Puerto Rican, New York, New York hip hop. Well, let's begin today. We're going to talk about race in Latin America. I am your professor, Joseph Holbrook. This is Introduction to Latin American and Caribbean. Uh, studies and we are continuing with our ninth video on a uh, giving an overview from a book by Philip Swanson the companion to Latin American studies this is chapter 10 race in Latin America So, this is a tough one, the meaning of race. It is difficult to define, and I might add a bit controversial. The history of the human race has been one of migration and intermixture, and we all share the vast majority of our genes. So, most scholars would assert that race does not exist biologically, but it does exist as a idea or a, a ideological construct. This idea of race came into existence, historically at least, in the 15th century, when the term begins to appear in various European languages. Before the 15th century, of course, slavery existed for a millennia, but it was not often race, uh, color-based. The word slave, for example, comes from Slav, or Slavic peoples who were enslaved by the, uh, the Roman Empire. The idea of race, the idea developed especially in the context of European domination of Africa and the New World in the 18th and 19th centuries, even going back to the 17th. The idea of race fully emerged with the enslavement of Africans by Europeans. So race becomes a way of referring to a set of supposed differences. Race in Latin America uh, generally refers to the differences or supposed differences between blacks or the descendants of African slaves and Indians. Uh, which are the indigenous peoples of the Americas, or whites, Europeans, who were the colonial exploiters of the Americas. So here we have three different genetic pools or groups. D the differences are often as much about culture or language as anything else, uh, but describing these three groups on their external uh, physical attributes leads to thinking of them as races, blacks, Indians, and whites. The colonial background uh, goes back to the Spanish and Portuguese colonists who first exploited the existing indigenous peoples uh, for labor. And as uh, I believe we've seen in other chapters this began on the island of Hispaniola, which is today modern Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It was the first landmass uh, conquered or discovered, um, exploited by the Spanish. It was the first island in which uh, uh, plantation slavery was developed based on sugar production, sugar cane, uh, the island of Hispaniola, and it's still problematic today. African slavery uh, developed with the main destinations being Brazil, especially the northeast of Brazil, Cuba, 
and New Granada. New Granada was the name for today's modern states of Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, and Venezuela. You see the uh, arrows there. There's a rough attempt to show proportional, uh, new, proportional quantities of slaves being taken from West Africa for the most part. The largest number going to Brazil, a second largest number going to the West Indies, primarily Cuba, and then others going to New Granada or the southern colonies of English colonies on the uh, North Atlantic coast, Mexico, etc. And you see over here Angola, the Congo, Guinea. Nigeria, Cameroon, Ivory Coast, uh, Guinea, Senegal, Gambia, uh, Ghana. So, three categories of race to be considered in this study. And it's symbolically rep or visually represented over this picture, a picture of a Brazilian family. Three polar categories of black white and indigenous uh, did not have clear boundaries indios were those who paid tribute in goods and or labor and lived in indigenous communities indios being the spanish name for them thinking that uh, when columbus made the mistake of thinking he had discovered india mulatos were uh, the the descendants or the children of white and black mixture Sambo was the uh, descendants of indigenous or black raced, black mixed race and uh, descendants. And mestizos were the progeny of Europeans and indigenous or Indian peoples. Black slaves, especially those born in Africa, instigated rebellions that constantly became cimarrones or fugitive slaves who sometimes formed rebel communities in remote areas called Palenques or Quilombos. One of the most famous Quilombos, if you wanted to do some reading on this, was a uh, was a African community named Palmares. It was an African kingdom set within a European colony in the Americas. Palmares uh, survived for almost uh, almost 90 years and had at one point at least 20,000 people from 1605 to 1694. It took the Brazil several military expeditions to subdue Palmares and return it to control. October 12th is celebrated as El Dia de la Raza. What does the October celebration called El Dia de la Raza uh, commemorate the term la raza may mean the la raza negra or may be used to refer to a national people uh, la raza mexicana la raza colombiana uh, evoking the image of a homogeneously mixed nation as in the 12th of october celebration of it, the el dia de la raza which commemorates the day that Cl christopher columbus landed in the americas and began the creation of a new race, quote unquote. Uh, we'll talk about Jose Vasconcelos, the Minister of Education in post revolutionary Mexico, who called for the recognition of the creation of La Raza Cosmica, or the cosmic race, with the idea being that a new race was being formed in Mexico composed of Europeans, Africans, and uh, indigenous peoples. So uh, that was La Raza Cosmica. Here's a picture uh, in, in a, an author's imagination of the arrival of Christopher Columbus. And here's a uh, modern day celebration of El Dia de la Raza. The colonial background of Spanish and Portuguese colonists first exploited existing indigenous people for labor. Once they found the uh, supplies of gold and silver to be exhausted, then they turned to human sweat and labor uh, 
for their enrichment. And of course, the Europeans, early Europeans who arrived in Hispaniola and then later, later traveled to Cuba and conquered Cuba and from Cuba launched into Mexico and from Mexico down through Central America to Panama. From Panama, they launched down the western coast of South America and conquered the Inca Empire. Uh, these Spanish adventurers, mercenaries, were looking, f they were entrepreneurs, uh, brutal entrepreneurs, looking to enrich themselves in ways that was impossible in, in Spain. So uh, as soon as they uh, were unable to locate silver and gold resources, they began to grow crops with the labor of the indigenous people. Slavery was initially used for this purpose, but the enslavement of indigenous peoples was soon prohibited by the Spanish kings, and they were deemed to be vassals of the crown. Informal enslavement of indigenous people did continue in some regions, especially Brazil. However, there was also another difficulty that they, they tended to work the indigenous people to death. They were weakened by disease and died in huge, unthinkable numbers. Also, in some places like the coast of Brazil, the males were accustomed to uh, felling trees and hunting, and it was the women's role to do agricultural labor. And so they had a great, the Brazilian or Portuguese colonists had great difficulty forcing the male Tupi Indians to do agricultural work. And so they ran into some labor problems early on in their exploitation of labor and indigenous peoples in the Americas. The, uh, the answer to this problem was to import slaves from Africa. For one thing, uh, indigenous peoples had no immunities to European diseases, but Africans basically shared many, most of the same immunities as Europeans because of the millennia of sharing, uh, uh, diffusion and cultural sharing and, uh, in the Eurasian and African uh, continents. So they were imported uh, to all the Spanish and Portuguese colonies, as you saw in large numbers to Brazil, but also large numbers to Haiti and Cuba. And they some were uh, imported into the southern, colon southern British colonies along the North American coast, others into New Granada, Mexico, uh, Brazil and Cuba were the main destination for Af African slaves, especially Brazil in the Northeast. Cuba, especially in the 19th century, when it took over from Haiti as one of the top sugar producers after the Haitian Revolution. New Granada also in Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Uh, this is why a lot of slaves passed through Cartagena on their way to other parts of New Granada. And here's another graphic representation of the, the uh, Atlantic Triangle or the Triangular Trade. Triangle referring to Europe, West Africa, and the Americas. And so raw materials were mined or produced in the Americas and shipped through the West Indies back to Europe. This included cotton, rum, sugar, tobacco, and others, other products later on. And in Europe, uh, many of these raw materials were manufactured into uh, in, uh, manufactured items, iron bars, glass, and glass beads, guns, cotton cloth, uh, maybe uh, steel hatchets or shovels. Those were then shipped to the west coast of Africa and traded with the African tribal leaders for slaves, African slaves, and then uh, as many as 10 million people, individuals or people over three and a half centuries were shipped back to the Americas. Uh, some estimates even go as high as 17 million. At least a million Africans died on the ships 
en route from Africa to the Americas. This was the evil triangular Atlantic slave trade. Mestizaje means mixture in Spanish. Uh, people who are part European and or part Spanish and part indigenous were known as mestizos in most of Spanish-speaking America. Uh, so this mixture was very frequent in Latin America, much less frequent in the British colonies. And uh, there were indigenous people mixed with um, Spaniards and Portuguese. There were indigenous people who were uh, born from liaisons between blacks and whites or blacks and Indians. So this, uh, this gave rise or created a socially stratified pyramid with Europeans at the apex. Uh, Peninsulares were the ones born in Spain. They were the highest. Creoles or Criollos were white Europeans born in the Americas to Spanish parents. To These were people who had, normally people who had two uh, European parents. Below them came the Mestizos who were born from a European and an indigenous usually indigenous mother, and then below them were Native Americans and enslaved people, Africans. This was the social stratification of the Latin American civilization, and to some extent still is today. Resistance to the colonial oppression and discrimination took a variety of forms. Indigenous people rebelled violently, in many cases fought pitched battles for the well-being of their communities, even under colonial rule. There's uh, one particular example in 1780 in Peru, the rebellion of Tupac Amaru. Uh, 100,000 people died over a five-year period of, of uh, very brutal fighting between Spanish and Creoles on one side against the indigenous and mestizos on the other. And note that this was just a few years before the independence movement. And it was one reason why places like Peru were reluctant to rebel against the king of Spain because they were afraid if they did that, they would open Pandora's box and their own indigenous peoples, was, which vastly outnumbered the Europeans, and the American-born Europeans, their own indigenous people, would rise up and overthrow them. And so Peru was the last country to, uh, to break with the Spanish king and become an independent country. Actually, Bolivia, which was part of Peru. So um, black slaves who instigated rebellions and fled from their owners uh, were called cimarrones, or fugitive slaves. And they sometimes were able to find remote areas in mountain or jungle areas and form rebel communities, which were called in Spanish palenques or in Portuguese quilombos. Uh, the most famous quilombo is Palmares. I think I've already mentioned that. Uh, Palmares in Brazil that, that endured for almost 90 years and had as many as 20 or 30,000 inhabitants. It was an African kingdom within a European colony situated in the Americas. The Haitian Revolution came about in 1791 in the French-speaking portion of the island of Hispaniola, which had been ceded to the French by the Spanish at the beginning of the 16th century. And uh, by the end of the 16th century, 1791, along comes the French Revolution. There was discussion about the evils of slavery and discussion about needing to end slavery and give mulattoes, free, free coloreds, and African and black slaves uh, equal rights. And of course, they heard about this and this helped spark the Haitian Revolution, which we're going to probably talk about more later. Um, independent nations. Independence from Spain and Portugal achieved for most areas by the 1830s. 
Like I said, uh, Peru, some of the last battles for independence from Spain and Portugal, uh, Spain was, were fought in the 1830s in Peru and Bolivia. Uh, along with independence from Spain usually came the abolition of slavery. A lot of the liberals, uh, speaking of the ideology of liberalism that existed at that time, uh, were opposed to slavery on moral grounds and philosophical. Everywhere by 1854, slavery had been outlawed in the American, the new American republics with three exceptions, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Brazil. Can you guess why there were those three exceptions? I'll give you a moment to think. Why would Cuba and Brazil and Puerto Rico drag their feet on ending slavery? Well, they're a large part of their export economy was based on sugar, sugar plantations. This was a mass produced, almost a factory type uh, operation that required heavy manual labor. And, it, and the simplest way for them to get manual labor for sugar production was to import slaves and to end slavery would be to open themselves to the possibility of of having happen in Brazil or Cuba uh, or Puerto Rico what happened in Haiti uh, about in the case of uh, Brazil nearly a hundred years before there was a bloody uprising in Haiti against the French owner plantation owners Brazil didn't want to repeat that neither did Cuba and so they were they they leaned on the Spanish monarchy in the case of Brazil the Portuguese uh, to no in the case of the Brazil I'm sorry the Brazilian emperor to uh, protect them from that kind of up, uprising slave imports from Africa continued uh, into the 1860s if you think about what else is going on in the world in the 1860s that's the period of the um, the u.s civil war over precisely the same issue uh so cuba and brazil are continue, continuing to import slaves even as in the united states the civil war is being fought to end slavery this gave black cultures their perhaps the most evident african component in latin america in other words brazil and cuba have large african uh Afro diaspora and Afro descendant uh, populations because of the heavy importation of African people up until nearly the 20th century. Racial eugenics was a sort of racist science in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The question of race uh, was on the minds of Latin American elites. The eugenics movement of the time allied itself with social reformers, doctors, and scientists in an attempt to control sexual reproduction. This was influenced also by Darwinianism and positivism. And they had a view to improving the racial quality of the national populations. And obviously that's a very racist way of thinking today, that by whitening a population, they might be improving uh, any aspect of the population. Latin American intellectuals argued that Mestizaje integrated black and indigenous minorities into the nations, into the nation. In uh, Argentina, they attempted to whiten the population by encouraging large scale immigration from Italy, uh, from Southern Euro uh, Europe, from Eastern Europe. And so uh, large numbers of Italians and Spaniards immigrated to Argentina. Uh, and actually, in effect, um, the black population of uh, Afro-Argentines gradually diminished and nearly disappeared as a result as they intermarried with uh, Argentines and with Italian and Spanish immigrants. There were numerous black political parties and indigenous movements of liberation, both insurrectionary as well as political. In Colombia in the 1980s, I remember this because I was living in Colombia myself in 
as an exchange student in the late 1980s. There was a guerrilla movement, uh, indigenous, uh, called Manuel Quintin Lame. Also in Guatemala, there were Quiche Indian leaders uh, working with insurgents and rebel groups against the Guatemalan government uh, that ended up being a 40-year civil war, resulting in what some people consider to be a, a genocide of these indigenous leaders. In the 1930s, there was the, the Frente Negra Brasileira, or I guess it should be pronounced the French Negra Brasileira. In 1908 in Cuba, there was the Partido Independiente de Color. In Brazil, you have a little different idea about race. Uh, race is viewed as a racial democracy. Um, it's, it's common to think among Brazilians that they're not racist, that they have a racial democracy. An example of this kind of view of a tolerant, integrated, mixed society can be found in Brazilian Gilberto Freire's book written, uh, published in 1933, Masters and Slaves. It's a work of sociology about basically showing how uh, inter mis uh, interracial mixing between uh, slaves and white Portuguese Europeans uh, helped produce the uniqueness of Brazilian society. Uh, however, class was more important than race in defining people's lives in Brazil. So unlike the United States, where it's very much color-based and a person who has a drop of uh, black blood in the United States in the Old South was considered to be black and there was no middle ground, in Br Brazil there's much more of a, a gradation of different uh, views. And if you have money you can pretty much buy your way up the, uh, the uh, social stratification. So that brings us to the end of our study. There's a few questions for review here. In which two countries did legal slavery persist the longest? What, which were the main racial groupings in the Americas? Uh, how did the so racial pyramid work? During the colonial period, who was at the top, who was at the bottom, who was in the middle? In what ways did indigenous Amerindians and African blacks resist captivity and oppression? Um, what did we say, what does the chapter say about the difference between how race is viewed in Brazil versus how it's viewed in the United States? Which country promoted the idea of a racial democracy? And another thing to think about is why did some intellectuals promote mestizaje? For, for example, Jose Vasconcelos and the, uh, uh, Mexic the Mexican Revolution. Who were the first slaves in the Americas? And I'm going to stop there. So thank you for your time and attention. This is our chapter on race in Latin America. I'll see you next time.